I'm First Lieutenant Danielle Ayer, Northern Warfare Training Center. Sergeant First Class Gusty, 140th Cav, Airborne, by Force and Valor. Specialist Corbin Huxley from the 1st of the 501st, Geronimo. I'm Chaplain Aaron, Arc 2 Wolf Chaplain. My name's uh, Master Sergeant Josh Lothspike. I'm uh, Jonathan Swope, Staff Sergeant Type, and I work for Northern Warfare Training Center. My name is First Lieutenant Stuart Wygant. I'm from 2-8 Field Artillery, Automatic. So being an Arctic warrior here in Alaska is not for everyone. But for those soldiers who want to be tested, for those soldiers who want to be challenged, this is definitely the place to be. Our motto here at U.S. Army Alaska is Arctic Tough. My name is Stephen Decker. I'm a training specialist at Northern Warfare Training Center, Fort Wainwright, Alaska. We train soldiers in uh, operations in mountainous and extreme cold weather uh, here in Alaska. In the summertime, uh, we, we have three courses that we run in the summer. We have a basic military mountaineering course, which is very heavily focused on um, rope work, uh, tying knots, uh, actually using ropes, different uh, installations, uh, high lines, uh, rope bridges, uh, fixed lines, fixed lines with intermediate anchors, things like that. That's what we do in the summer on that course. Uh, the second course is uh, what we call an advanced military mountaineering course where they learn technical climbing, placing artificial protection in a, in a rock in order to get them uh, up the face of the rock so that they can either gain a position of advantage over an enemy or allow follow-on forces to come up that same route. Uh, we have the third course, which is the uh, Mountain Warfare Orientation course, which teaches a very basic overview on the other two classes. And we kind of lay that out for uh, leadership folks, uh, company level leadership and higher, so that they can understand what the level one, level two Mountaineer can do for them in their units. In the winter time, we have the cold weather orientation course, which again is for staff officers, staff NCOs, so that they can understand what right looks like with all the tasks that we teach in our other bigger course, the Cold Weather Leaders course. In that course, the students are gonna go ahead and learn how to set up their 10-man tents, two different uh, styles of fuel fire heaters. They'll also learn how to maintain them. Uh, they learn avalanche uh, tasks in there. They learn uh, several different types of first aid uh, medicine uh, classes in there learn how to shoot on skis, learn how to shoot on snowshoes, build field fortifications, uh, all that good stuff in there. Uh, that's what we primarily teach in the winter. Um, so for instance, our, our training and um, every Denali team has created their own uh, train up and every, everything like that. We chose to do most of our training at Black Rapids and in that area. Um, so our, our first training was just there on on site in the training area and so we had the building to fall back on and stuff like that as people got used to cold weather training and figuring out what clothing worked and what didn't work um, and then uh, after that we started to branch out a little bit further our next training was uh, up by the Canwell Glacier in the Rainbow Rainbow Basin is what it's called and that was also fairly easy to we we're still in radio contact with Black Rapids and stuff like that, but branched out a little bit further and, and then actually got some glacier work. And then after that, we went eight miles up the uh, Kastner Glacier, which our, our bailout plan for that is, you know, we, we walk out. And so it was just a gradual um, little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more exposed, um, a little less, a little bit more risk yeah, each time on each training uh, mission that we did. Denali, we treat it like a capstone training event, meaning that um, they've gone through all this basic level training, a little bit more advanced training, and then the, the final exam, if you will, is uh, we generally hold that up on Denali uh, for the mountain phase of things that we do. Uh, we have another capstone training event that we do up north of the Arctic Circle uh, that we do in March. Uh, we'll take soldiers up there and ski them around uh, way up north of the Arctic Circle. Right. 
Colorado, um, because so for instance, in Alaska, if we go to get above 14,000 feet, um, it's a really big commitment. Typically, you have to fly in somewhere, so there's that as well. But then um, it's kind of a one shot, one kill. Um, you really only can, in the two weeks that we were in Colorado, we probably would have gotten one mountain um, and only been at 14,000 feet for a brief time. You know, in Colorado, you can drive to said mountain and climb it that day, hang out at the top and come down and kind of do that uh, throughout the two weeks. And so while we were there, we summited six separate 14ers and spent a total of, oh, I'd probably, you know, probably at least 24 to 48 hours. Um, not in one shot, but at different times at 14,000 feet. It's a little bit difficult to do here. And spring is much earlier, so the weather conditions are a little bit better. Um, and so our goal was is to get all our cold weather training prior and then Colorado would be all our altitude training. And it was just a easier spot to do it. So our, our risk level on Denali is even lower just because we can come to Colorado, just because we can experience 14,000 feet. And this is what our, our fifth peak, <laughs> our, fourth, our fourth peak um, that we've done in about a week and a half. Um, so fun fact is we are hiking above the San Luis Valley. My family settled the San Luis Valley back in the 1800s. So coming home a little bit and then I've hiked this trail before. I hiked with my dad right before I joined the army. So right here where we're walking 17 years ago is kind of his send off to me. And uh, so we're doing Blanket Trail. It's the fourth highest peak in Colorado. We're also walking on a four wheel drive trail and it's rated uh, one of the top trend trails in the US that can kill you. So. Step carefully. Hey, Ma. Uh, I didn't think I'd have cell phone service. I'm just shocked. We're up here almost 11,000 feet in one of the most rural places in Colorado, and there's a cell tower somewhere close. I'm shocked. Anywho, since it's Mother's Day, I know I called you yesterday. I thought I'd call you again when she had for Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day! been here before? First trip? One. Awesome. So the purpose of the briefing is to try to give you all some kind of rules and regulations as well as uh, just talk about our purpose on the mountain as rangers uh, and I think just kind of set you all up for success as much as possible. Everything you bring into the mountain, you carry it off. So like We'll talk about it in a minute, but you can make caches along the route. Uh, those need to be like dug back up, bring them out. Uh, and then I think equally important is think about on your summit day when you have little candy bars and uh, wrappers that are brittle and cold and your fingers don't work and you're in gloves. Uh, have a system for managing that garbage uh, so that it's not just blowing off the mountain. Um, come up with those things early on so that you have a pocket, you have a trash bag, whatever. Uh, keep Denali clean. Make sense? Yeah. Awesome. The second part of the, the trash management uh, component is the CMC process of human waste. Um, these cans were developed maybe 20 years ago. Uh, and the idea, if you call CMC, I can try and move it closer. But, um, Poop in the cans. The cans have a liner inside of them. They don't need a liner if it was if you're desperate or the 
the liner breaks, it's not a huge deal. Um, but for each can, I would say you can get 12 uses out of it. Um, the What you put inside the can, just poop and toilet paper. Inside the CMC, just use, like, just poop and TP. Don't pee inside it. It's extra weight uh, that freezes and will fill up. And it's, uh, um, yeah, you're just using it inefficiently. If, when you travel with them, carry them upright. Uh, and I can kind of talk about that demo in a second. Um, but upright in your sled and upright in your pack is probably the best idea. You'll get some of these bags, like I said. Bags go in. If you're the first user, I would have that thing uh, just pushed up against the wall as much as possible as you can. When you're gonna use it, sit right down on it. I don't recommend hovering. Uh, use the pee bottle. <clears throat> and then after you are done, go to a central location where there, like other people in the camps have all used to like dump out their pee. From base camp up to 11,000 foot camp, uh, the expectation is carry carry the CMC the entire way. At 11,000 feet, uh, you can cache your CMCs, and so like dig a hole, you'll leave it there, uh, and and then at 14,000 feet, like so you can go up, start a new CMC here at 14,000 feet, and there will be a marked crevasse at 14,000 feet. Use the CMC but then take the bag of poop and dump it in the crevasse. Uh, it's, it's unforgiving. So the Arctic environment, unlike anything I've ever flown into, include Afghanistan. First of all, it's, it's, there's more planning and preparation required and equipment required to make sure that we operate safely, uh, especially when we're flying places like Denali. Uh, it's at a scale that most people don't understand, and even while you're flying it, you understand how big the place really is. And the hidden, uh, let's say the, the hidden threats and challenges that the terrain provides. It's, relatively shocking honestly until you go out there and experience it you have no idea what to expect so it's a uh, it's higher colder and less forgiving than any place I've ever flown Is this a dream? Uh, this is amazing. I know the pictures don't do it justice. Doesn't even seem real. You walked among the giants today. That's right. You know, hit the hit the ground. It was uh, early afternoon, and we just wait. We wait a little bit. So uh, first glacier. The Kilt, the glacier at the at the bottom, it's fairly warm. You know, it can get you know 40, 50 degrees, and when you add the reflection off the snow, it's just really, really warm. And then you have your rucksack and your sled and everything like that. So we decided to wait a little bit, wait till you know the sun went down and cooled off. And you know, we're everybody had you know uh, probably an 80 pound sled, a 50, 60 pound rug. You're you're dealing with 150 pounds roughly. So the amount of heat that your body generates when you're pulling that is, it's up there. First leg, <coughs> on the way to camp one, almost 8,000 feet. Pretty flat the whole way, we just dropped a little bit over something called, something called Heartbreak Hill. We're just gonna go about another four miles or so. Um, relatively flat terrain and make our camp there at camp one. Pretty simple movement, nothing big, nothing crazy. Uh, the trail already skirts around all the crevasses and uh, avoid an avalanche change or just by being right here in the middle of this glacier. So it's a pretty safe, safe day. All right. 
Okay, so here we are, morning two. Or day two. Um, just getting up, getting ready. It's supposed to be windy today. And we'll be heading up from Camp 1 at 7,800 feet on up to uh, probably stop the night at Camp 3, which is uh, about 11,200 feet. And slept pretty good last night. The back is pretty sore. But nothing a little oatmeal won't help. So, time to get ready for another wonderful day on Denali. Surprised I had enough tape. It's amazing. Yeah. Love it. Me too. We got underwear on my head, duct tape on my nose. What else? <laughs> saw how hot it got and how quick. You know, by 10, 11 o'clock, it was pretty warm. By the time we got up there, at two o'clock, it was brutal. It is hot out here today. All right, so we're here at uh, Camp 1, 7,800 feet. We're gonna try for Camp 11, which is 11,000 feet. Um, on the way there, there's a place to stop that it's like at 9,200 feet. Um, if you if you need it to it's about 12 o'clock and uh, this is kind of our second day of the journey and we go up something called ski hill so it's kind of a long push it's a hill behind me there how do you make holy water you boil the hell out of it Yeah, so we're doing nightly jokes for morale purposes, so. Perfect. I'd rather just not have morale. <laughs> wow. All right. You want to know the best joke? <laughs> it's happiness. <laughs> Ouch. Ouch. All right, guys. Operation uh, Blackout. Crank it up to 11. Right. I was literally thinking that the whole time. We're like, yeah, we're going to 11. Crank it up to 11. <laughs> Sergeant First Class Gusty, the amazing ruck organizer there we and go. sled. That's better. Yeah, okay. So let's talk us through right. here what you have here, Sergeant First Class Gusty. How so in the back here, so in, in my pack I have three days of food at all time. One of them's in there now, but one is immediate access for right here with all my Abbey stuff. That's the day I eat. I have them broken down by day. So like this is day sevens. Don't mind the terrible riding. And I keep a week in here between my sled and this. A week, got some books, extra Nalgene, extra snacks, just in case I want them. Three and a half pounds of gummy bears and other things. What are you having for dinner, Corbin? Ooh, Alfredo pasta with sun-dried basil tuna for dinner of champions. Do we have a joke on the back of the, the wrapper? Uh, yes. Let's hear it. What kind of a bear has no teeth? A gummy bear. Oh, I like it. That's a big deal though. And the, so the Audubon is, you go up 17 camp, and then you like traverse this really, you traverse this really steep. You know what's after this? Yeah. And uh, you go to the Nellie Pass. Summit winds 20 to 30 miles per hour, and then Tuesday night increased winds to 40 miles an hour. That's at the summit. 20 to 30. Tonight at base camp mostly yeah. clear, low of 20. Tomorrow at base camp sunny, high of 35. 
tomorrow night at base camp, mostly cloudy, with a low of 20. Break. Air 14,000 feet for tonight, clear, with a low of 5 degrees. Tomorrow for 14 camp, sunny, with a high of 15 degrees. Nice. And tomorrow night for 14, mostly cloudy. And high camp, 17,000 feet to the summit for tonight. Mostly clear with a low of minus 15 with summit winds north to 25. Tomorrow for high camp, sunny with a high of zero and north winds 20 to 30. Tomorrow night for high camp, slightly cloudy with a low of minus 20 and winds north west to 40. All right, another beautiful day on Denali. Yes, an amazing night's sleep. Sorry to swoop, our early risers getting our coffee ready for us. Can't wait, he does such a good job. It's better than Starbucks. What's up, Corbin? I was just joking about what I said about eating your breakfast. I would never do that. Oh, Especially okay. how you, you, after you made my water for me last night. That was so nice of you. What is up? I was just, just been trying to push things out of my sleeping bag so I had more room. <laughs> <laughs> so there it was yesterday afternoon, 70 degrees almost or more, and sweating like crazy. It's and now, zero. now we wake up at probably what, close to zero? It's well, we got a wind going, so we're probably below zero with wind chill. With level sevens? <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't like to be cold. Yeah, uh, me either. Here you go, Big Papa. Thank you. Sleep mat one. <clears throat> you got water ready. All right, appreciate it. If I can get, ever get my boots on. Yeah. Uh, I'd say about half the teams will leave their um, leave their stuff at Camp One and walk up to Camp Two, which is at 11,000 feet, and put in a cache and then come back down and then take the rest of their stuff. So you're kind of splitting it up. If you do it in one push, it's a really long, slow movement, uh, especially when you're going uphill. And so we went ahead and pushed. We pushed uh, to Camp Two and. Uh, well, a little bit before camp two, and then the next morning we pushed the rest of the way. Yeah, so we need to build up wind walls, and this ground's really hard. It's pretty iced over. It's gonna make perfect blocks. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to cut out the perimeter of where our tent will go and then I'll checker it up with a few more cuts and we can just scoop out blocks, have a perfect flat surface for our sleeping area, and have perfect symmetrical blocks for our wind walls. Audubon is up on an area of Denali called um, Denali Pass. Uh, it gets its name uh, from a few German climbers that had you know, fallen down there a whole bunch of years ago and the name just kind of stuck. Uh, but it is a, a very, a very interesting piece of ice up there. Uh, people do 
uh, fall off there quite regularly uh, throughout the season. And once they fall, it's usually a bad one just because of the way that um, the, the ice angles and the length of the drop up there. We don't have a request as of yet, but we're wondering if you have eyes on this party um, or have the ability to try and reach them from your location via FRS-1. We get over. This is a rough year. Yeah, that'd be great. We'd like to encourage them to make their way down. Day one took us to day two, and then on day three we went all the way to the camp at 11. Um, stayed there for uh, two days, I believe. And we had some weather that kept us there an extra day, and, and also we, this is where you want to start to climatize. So, like I know NWTC, our, our motto is to uh, battle cold and conquer mountains, or conquer cold, battle mountains, whichever one. It's actually uh, battle cold, conquer mountains. And kind of have a different personal take on it, you know. You, so we have cold, and you can battle it all you want, but if he wants to take you out, he's going to take you out, no matter what you're wearing, no matter how big of a fire you get going. That cold, he can take you out. It's so the best thing that you can do to somebody that can whoop you is you make them your buddy. So you find this guy cold, and you make him your friend. You say, "Hey, what's up, buddy?" And you kind of hang out. And then when your enemy shows up. And he wants to fight you, you just look over and you say, Hey Cold, can you take care of this for me? And he goes and whoops him. And you just get to sit on your porch and rock back and forth because you made friends with the cold. And um, that now from 11 to 14 camp, you, we did that in, in two, uh, two carries. So we took all our stuff, set it in a cache, and then came back down, stayed the night, and the next day uh, moved up to 14 camp. Hold on. Oh, oh wow. <coughs> oh, so our weather God, for tomorrow. <laughs> our weather for tomorrow, both from the NREACH and from mountainforecast.com. Say uh, winds aren't bad tomorrow, light and variable uh, throughout the day, but it is supposed to snow, but there's no accumulation. So it's probably going to be just like what's this. What's the visual? Like, what's day. like? The what? Is it going to be light out? Like, what's the uh, visual condition? It, it, that, that they don't give. They don't give that much detail, but they do give like wind. Wind speed was really low, um, so winds are light and variable like throughout the day. So we'll probably have some gusts, and then. Um, and the snow is probably going to be similar to this, just off and on throughout the day. Um, and we'll see what they say tonight over the icon. Okay, is that for 11 or is that for 14? Both. Both? Yeah. 14 is a little bit windier and a little bit colder. Yes, that's all it was. Yeah. So, yeah. But Saturday looks rough. If we don't um, we gamble don't a little bit tomorrow, to, uh, tomorrow would be a good day to gamble. Today would have been a good day to gamble. Um, but as you guys notice, nobody has come down from 14, and then also nobody's back yet that left, and it's 8 o'clock. Yesterday was not a uh, day. Well, I 
probably started yeah. out. all the way at 14 camp, which will pay off tomorrow, and uh, so we'll head back down tomorrow, or tonight, and then tomorrow morning we'll come back up with our tents and everything, and camp somewhere over here, hopefully, weather permitting. See this. So this is why you buy nice mountaineering boots before you come up to the When we came back, <laughs> oh, man. but you know, we'll work through it. Yep. So we traveled three miles and did roughly 3,000 feet of elevation gain. Um, and it was awful but <clears throat> we made it so you know uh, so we got here and originally um, tomorrow was supposed to be really windy and everything so we worked really really hard on our wind walls which was exhausting just because no matter what you do you just end up breathing hard even simple things like stepping outside the tent you just have to catch your breath and um, so we got a really decent campsite put together. We're ready for bad weather, but then the weather report came in that um, tomorrow's supposed to be actually pretty nice. So tomorrow we'll probably work on wind walls a little bit, which is kind of an everyday thing. And then <clears throat> there's this place here called the edge of the world, and it really does feel that way. You walk there and there's just this vast expanse below you. And then there's also um, a place to throw your bags full of human poo into a crevasse. So we have that to look forward to as well. One of the joys of mountaineering is when you're bivouacking, you gotta have to make water. So what we'll normally do is we'll find a place, nice piece of real estate that looks untouched by mankind and we'll dig a hole there and we'll excavate some snow and we'll melt it. Um, once you then melt it, you fill up your Nalgene's. <laughs> so inside my Nalgene bottle, I found a curly hair from a questionable region of the human anatomy. Uh, it's a lot less scary when you put it in your food because it's probably, there's probably three or four curly fries in there. I'll never know. Just stir it up. Don't think about what you're doing. You eat it, you're good. As long as we're not heading into it, but we're leaving it, right? And we're, yeah. we're, we're pushing through it. Yeah. It just, it, it depends on how soft it is. Right now, it's. That's what I'm saying. If it clears up this afternoon <laughs> and, and it's clear at 1700. If Bob well is soaking up, because, I mean, it's not like we're tired, we're well rested. That's true. And then we, we walk all through the night, we get up there to the morning, three in the morning, we set up camp and we sleep into our rest day. And that way, we're our rest day, we're actually sleeping a little bit. So that as soon as it's good weather up there, we're ready to put this out. <laughs> With the knife. <laughs> <laughs> but it, so the other thing is, there, there's only one guided group going up today. They and that's because they're pressed on time, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Aren't all you old guys pressed on time? <laughs> <laughs> Leo definitely is. Why you guys gotta go there? <laughs> Not a word came out of my mouth. 
Did you guys hear what happened with those two people coming down the hill last night? I didn't. Uh -uh. Were they hurt or anything? That guy oh. was still coming down at 12.30 last night. Yeah. The one, they were on the head wall and then coming down for hours. I mean, we watched yeah. him like for four hours. The dude, it was the dude, like, like he looked like he safety himself off to the head wall. And then it looked like Full he was like doing like a running belay with his buddy, but he wasn't. And then it took him, um, let's say, two more hours of watching him. They made it down another 50 meters. So on and so forth. And 12.30, they were still working their way down. I only saw one when I went out. Yeah. The other guy just gave up on him, I think. I heard some guys come in the camp, and I think it was them, and they were talking about how they summited. Uh, I was going to say, like, man, they just had, like, a 14-day summit, and they are just fucking <laughs> smoked. They were just so dead. Yeah. There's some guy saying, like, he just had the hardest day of his life, and they I don't know, he was just trying to set up camp or something. That's when you just get, you just look down at the head wall, you get your ice axe, and you just, like, stick it in, kind yeah, of, and you just slide, slide down. You're like, ah, whatever. That's what, like, I, I, I saw people coming through 17 camp, and they had summited from here, and they looked rough. Yeah. Every single one of them, like, definitely contemplating life choices. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, this is slightly stressful for me. Tranquilo. We'll be okay. Everything buffs out. Buffs out. I mean, worse comes to worse. Yeah, we do have like four days up. here. Oh, yeah, actually, it is. Look at that. Look at that. It's clear. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Then yeah, worst yeah, comes to worst, right. then we just send it and everything will be okay. We'll sit in the tent, watch the TV show, come back out and bam, this guy. Yeah, let's yeah. give it like 30 minutes. If it's still like, if it continues like this, like it's a little bit more clear, let's go. Yes! <laughs> Onward! Onward! 11 o'clock. <laughs> Nice. That is so much harder than it needed to be. Just think how hard it's going to be on the summit. Yeah, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> I said I would. So 14 camp is kind of in a bowl. Yeah. And so when you felt the earth shake and there were two separate rumbles and the first one was fairly small and we kind of looked and then the second one was much bigger. And so I thought, and so did every, everybody else thought an avalanche was coming. Not that um, avalanches happen very, they, they do happen there and you see where they have happened but they typically don't roll into camp. It's a pretty safe place to stay. But it's like, if I'm feeling it, this one's huge. And you know, I jumped up out of the tent and just looking around and everybody else is looking around so I knew I wasn't imagining it and uh, and you know everybody discussing you know, throughout the camp everybody's talking about what had happened and so you could you could feel it and then it kept coming. <laughs> you could feel it more and I was like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> what a way to die. Oh, the way the ground shook, it might have, might have been an earthquake. It might have know. been an earthquake. I don't know. <sighs> oh. Pretty big. Out I don't know. It, it sounded like a. Like it that. sounded like a cracking in a. <coughs> I don't know. Did you hear something that sounded like kind of like a crack? I 
<laughs> so, I, I've been in an earthquake before. I didn't, I wasn't I didn't really. I was too concerned until I felt, felt the ground shake. <laughs> and I was like, ah. Oh. I was like, that's coming. Oh, no. <laughs> but it could have been an earthquake that caused <coughs> this slide. Sure I don't know. <coughs> All right. Welcome to Denali. <laughs> Land of excitement. <coughs> what was it? A 6.2? 6.7. We had a, so last night we had a a 6.7 magnitude earthquake that uh, caused a, a bunch of debris and some small avalanche and ice fall in and around camp. Um, kind of a scary thing to happen, but in this part of Alaska, it's pretty common. Uh, Alaska is located or the Alaska Range is located kind of in a convergence of a, a fault line that is not far off the Alaska range. They believe the, uh, the earthquake originated in Taquitna, which is where we took off from, so pretty close. And uh, not a fun place to have an earthquake, obviously, because of the, the dangers that it causes, but um, something to be aware of and a, a danger we definitely face here on the mountain. A wise person once said that if I have seen further, it's because I've stood upon the shoulders of giants. To our fallen heroes and to their families who will never forget. I invite you out now all to lay down the patches with the units whom you've served in honor of those who have made the ultimate sacrifice. I invite you all now to join me in a moment of silence. Yeah. All right. So I went and talked to the other guided group. They're going up right now. Um, they uh, have a group up at 17. At, at 17 camp, they said the winds are manageable at 17, and winds are mostly what you're worried about right now. Um, we're worried about the flat light, and um, backed up against time. They are backed up against time. They're running out of time, but uh, so we're just gonna hold squat. We're gonna get completely ready to go, except we're not gonna put tents away, and and go from there and see what happens. But yeah. There's a couple groups leaving today, so that's always good. There's an added element of risk to leaving it. But if it clears in straight blue sky, how long is it going to be that way though? It's not, our weather is not predicted to be clear. We have no clear weather predicted for the next three days. So our weather window is the best.
days for weather to clear. And then we went ahead and went on up to the camp at 18, 18,000 feet. And, um, and that's when your days start to really get rough, where altitude comes into play like a lot, and it's much, much colder. And you have wind with it as well, so 20, 20 degrees below zero, the winds are a little bit higher. So with wind chill, it's really common to see stuff with wind chill 60 below. And it's kind of the normal, the norm, not the to 40 below, uh, stuff like that. Did you recap today? Anyone? <laughs> Huxley? I would say cold. Where are you? Cold, windy. Probably at least about negative 20, you think? Oh, I'd say even worse. While we're trying to set up I'd our bivouac site? 30 below. 30 below, probably? Yeah, I mean, I was in full. I was in full level seven, um, shoveling and working hard, and still like, I mean, I wasn't dangerously cold, but I wasn't yeah. warm. Yeah, I, uh, I'm feeling a little bit more normal right now, but how was I acting earlier? A little? You were. A little weird? You were. Ask, ask it. I, spaced out. I, I saw you stumble, sorry, Major. Yeah, I tripped a few things. <laughs> oh, you tripped, okay. Uh. No, 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 like, you were over and you were cutting, and then you'd stop and like cut it differently and it made no sense I saw you, at all. I saw you, I looked up and I saw you staring at me. I was cutting like a, a my line was so crooked it was ridiculous. Huxley, what's up sir? Look at me. How hey, you like that? That's beautiful. This is one of those days we can't forget. Sergeant Major, how you feeling? Good. Slight headache? Yeah, same here. I feel like I'm high in the world. Slight headache, a little bit of throw up taste. Can't talk straight, stumbling. I don't have the throw up taste. <laughs> oh. Hey everyone, I'm really weak right now, feeling terrible. Well, I mean, either way, it's, <laughs> but, but it's, it's what happens. That's why I went and talked to you several times. Oh like, my goodness. All right, are you Hey, sure? thanks for that jail. You, you hooked me up with some jail. And uh, what, the, what was the other But thing? I felt it too, like, I went and I had to untie the the bag that this fly was in. Yeah. I simple knot, and <laughs> it took me much longer than it should have. Yeah. And and part of it was my hands were cold, but I also could not figure out exactly how the knot. And it was a very simple overhand knot. Yeah. So it's wow. It's just what happens when you first get here, and hopefully your brain and body adjust. If it does not, then we give you a dexedron and we take you down. Sergeant Swope, how are you feeling today? Pretty good, but I need you. These. What, just because I don't know where I am doesn't mean I need to eat here. Yeah, no, no, no. I told you, I know this is Mount Everest. How many times do I have to tell uh, yeah. you? Oh, look at those eyebrows. Wow. Does it? Look, look how frosty. Yes, those are beautiful. Just call me Jack Frost, John Frost. John Frost. <laughs> what a good time. Except you, you weren't hurting at all, were you, Huxley? Um, no, my head is pounding right now, and I can't wait to drink a bunch of water. Yeah, the headache is no fun. You have a headache, Hux? Yeah, uh, it's a small I, one. I got, a pretty, I, I got a pretty good headache, too. I think I'm just a little dehydrated. Yeah, I'm definitely from... dehydrated. I only oh. drink half an LG. Well, I have today. Tylenol, ibuprofen, and aspirin. Oh, I, don't, I don't think I'll In my medic kit. Now. I'll just drink water, son. Drink water, eat food, and... I didn't drink a whole lot after I lost my water bottle. I was kind of upset about that. Oh yeah, that was <laughs> that was something, man. I tried to catch it, but <laughs> three water times water. on the head wall. Flying down the head wall. <laughs> wow. I don't think I want to go up the head wall again. So uh, I'm here at what I call Pride Rock. I don't know what the actual name of it is, but it just really reminds me of the fossil holding up Simba. It says everything the light touches is your kingdom, whatever. Anyway, kind of see forever up here. And kind of do a talk through the last couple of days. We, uh, first thing we did is we got to 17 as we went up the head wall which is 
back behind me somewhere covered in clouds right now and uh we sit in our cache at 16,200 feet and then went back down and everybody we all kind of started getting antsy and so we took uh kind of took a risk and we decided to sp kind of late from 14 right, yeah. right there right yeah, yeah the sp kind of late from 14 camp and once we got to the head wall uh, some of these feet were just they've been cold and they've been cold way too long and once you get to the top of the head wall you have to walk across the actual west buttress and the wind just hammers the west buttress which is right behind me which is what those people are walking on right now and there's just no relief from it and so even though we were antsy and really wanting to get up here and everything like that we, were, we decided to bail and when we got down you could tell that his feet were in poor shape but nothing that wasn't recoverable um, no frostbite just yet and we turned around just in time and so we're going to leave him and one other guy down at 14 camp i can even see their tent right now i feel like the grinch staring down at whoville a little bit but um and unfortunately his climb is done and uh it's it's just one of the risks you make you, you come out here and you may find out that your equipment is not good enough or or just your 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 feet don't stay warm just things like that um and so we went down that night and then the next morning uh we left them the two of them and the rest of us came up here to 17 and when we got up here it was extremely cold it was 20 degrees below zero and with probably a 25 30 mile an hour wind um you know making the wind chill uh 35 to 40 below zero and you know so it was a smart thing to turn him around and and have him stay down at 14,000 feet um, if you have an injury at 17,000 feet it's really really difficult to get somebody down the head wall to a safe place and, and you know that's that's kind of it so now we're just kind of waiting for our weather window um we're getting conflicting reports about the weather tomorrow um so there's reports that it's going to be bad there's reports that it's going to be good and you know denali being this big huge mountain all by itself or herself or whatever gender this mountain is but i believe she pulls weather in and just does whatever she wants and so we're gonna see after the autobahn um you hit what's called denali pass then you kind of head up those black rocks and they call it kind of zebra something zebra whatever <laughs> And then you move out past beyond that. It's only two and a quarter miles, but you um, climb 3,000 feet two and a quarter miles, which is significant, especially significant because you're well above 17,000 feet. And so, uh, you know, two and a quarter miles, a lot of times it takes people um, anywhere from eight to 10 hours to summit. And so you have to be careful if you want to get your summit in. And so that's what we're waiting for. No showers will persist tonight below 14,000 feet. And we tie Eastern pressure system moves over the mountain tonight and tomorrow. We gotta go. Down at 7,000 camp tonight, mostly cloudy with a chance of snow and a low of 20 degrees. Tomorrow, mostly cloudy with a chance of snow and highs in the mid 30s. That's at 7 camp. Tomorrow night, mostly cloudy with a chance of snow and lows around. <laughs> So right now we're on the Autobahn, which is 
just beyond the 17,000 foot camp en route to the Denali summit. And just a few days ago, somebody fell here. And had to be airlifted out, so definitely gotta be careful here. All right, 2021. I can't even talk right now. <laughs> oh my, where are we? 2021 Yusarak Denali Expedition Team at the summit, 20,310 feet. June 3rd, 1800 hours, summit time. June 4th. It's June 4th. Crap. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Where are the warriors? That battle mountains conquered cold. <laughs> God, I have no strength. Do you want us to hold you up, please? Do you know us walk away? Nope. Ready? Oh. That's all I can muster. For Deo, a patria, for God and country, Arctic Wolves Brigade, the only Arctic Striker Brigade in the Army. The Usarak Denali Expedition Team. It's June 4th, right? June 4th. Okay. June 4th, we made it here. We had a great time. We're just hoping that we get down safe. Safe climb is the best climb. 20,310 feet. Here there we, we go. go. Randy, Randy, lead the way. Six RTB for the win. All right. <laughs> Nailed it, almost. <laughs> Right. Your eighth time climbing this mountain, huh? What years were those? 1906, <laughs> 1912, <laughs> 1928. There was a pause there because he had to go to war. <laughs> yeah. World War II happened. <laughs> then Vietnam. 1978, 2008, and then 2019 and 2021. There you go, eight times. So well-known fact that when George Washington was crossing the Delaware, swope was the right hand man. So as we're coming down the mountain uh, from the summit, uh, one of the climbers, you know, he's starting to get tired and we're all, you know, get clumsy after you're walking for eight or nine hours and you're up at high elevations. And one of the members of the rope team uh, tripped and slid off the side of the slope as we're going down uh, the Audubon, uh, just coming down from the, the uh, the Denali Pass. I don't want anyone to know that I fell on the Audubon, so make sure that this is not recorded and, no, okay, so, <clears throat> I, actually I do want people to know that uh, I fell on the Audubon, so hopefully if they're climbing Denali, they don't fall like I did. Had we not been paying attention, or had he not been roped in, he could have fallen uh, over a thousand feet to, to be severely injured or even uh, uh, even could have uh, died from that from that incident. I, uh, I yeah I was I was coming down from the summit, and uh, bottom line is the the rope started getting tangled around my foot, and when I tried to untangle the rope, um, I, the next thing I know I was sliding down the mountain, and immediately uh, started to dig my ice axe in, and all of the uh, the other rope team members dug their ice axe in and leaned into the mountain and rescued my fall and. Uh, thankfully, it, it wasn't bad, but it definitely could have been. So yesterday we left. We left around 10 o'clock. Uh, once the sun hit the Audubon, you know that trail there behind us. Um, unfortunately, that's all really everybody talks about is the Audubon and how difficult that is. But after that, you hit um, several inclines before you get to uh, um, Archdeacon's Tower. You get around those two camel humps. Um, you, you get onto what's called the football field, but nobody talks about these hills right there. And to me, those were more difficult than the actual Autobahn, which is what everybody talks about. And it was awesome. It was a great climb. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. So uh, I think the struggle is, is what makes it a little bit better than, than if it was just a cakewalk or if you took a tram to the top. At 70 degree weather the whole way.
There it is. Found it. Can you get up there? Is this a dream? Oh, I really need some help. Kevin, thanks, brother, for all your help. Hey, brother, Surprising sir. us this morning with a visit. We didn't know you guys were coming today, so yeah. awesome. Oh, thanks. Glad to be here, all right, sir. yeah. Oh, you're a dunk. Okay, a little much. Just well, I needed to close it in. Okay. Is it dark? Yeah. Uh, you know, it didn't end like I thought it would. Um, I still had a lot of great experiences out there. I was happy to be a part of the team. There's definitely an element of disappointment because um, I didn't make it to the summit, but uh, sometimes, you know, things go that way. And, you know, I had to make the decision to um, stay at 14 camp while the team went on. And that was definitely the hardest part of the climb for me. Uh, just the realization that, you know, the equipment I had uh, was not good enough to get to the summit and to go further would jeopardize the, the whole climb for the whole team. It was the right decision uh, looking back, but it's still hard to uh, think about okay. that. And um, just all the months of preparation and everything leading up to the climb and then uh, to kind of feel that um, incompleteness, I guess, with the, uh, the mission at hand, that's hard. Um, but looking forward, I know that I know what I need to do if I want to go back there, and I think I do want to go back and, and finish it. If I want to go back, I know what I have to do now, and um, it's it's going to be tough. But I know exactly where the trail is. I know how to get there, and um, I can go back with some friends and do it again. I think the most challenging part was not getting to be on the top with R9, the whole team. Going into 17 camp. All of my fellow climbers keep making fun of me for not being in my right state of mind. Um, but yeah, I definitely have not felt that physically, mentally exhausted since ranger school. I would say the first two days, the very first two days, um, you fly into base camp, you're at 7,200 foot elevation, you dip down and you start going up the hill a little bit. And uh, I don't know if it was the effects of altitude or what, but I was not prepared for those warm temperatures we experienced. Um, Basically, it was the hottest I've ever been on a glacier in my entire life. Uh, I sweat profusely, consumed a lot of water. Um, that was probably the trickiest part. I, I didn't really expect to encounter heat on the glacier uh, that early in. Not every single squad is gonna be 100% successful all the time. And I think we proved that. Some guys are gonna be good in some areas, some are not gonna be good in other areas but it's through all those lessons and shared hardships that you can come together, you know, and rally back together as a, as a troop or a formation or a squadron, whatever it may be, and, and become the cohesive team that you need to be. I think, I think it's just the, the exposure. I think you're like, you know, you're, you're waiting out weather or you're something like that. You're kind of just bungled up in your tent. Uh, makes it a little bit easier when, you know, you're with people and you got a good group and, you know, you have good communication stuff, but played a lot of solitaire. I think it was just not being able to do stuff was like the, my biggest struggle because I always wanted to move. Uh, like we were talking about doing that, that night movement. I'm just like already up the head wall. Everyone's freezing and I just want to keep charging. I think that was the biggest thing was just waiting for me. Yeah, I felt isolated. The hardest part of the climb, I would have to say, would uh, just be bat battling the cold. Uh, there was some days up there where I knew we were going to have to move and it was going to be cold. And just thinking about little things, all the little things you got to do just to keep yourself right when the temperatures are so far below zero. 
you know, how am I gonna warm my feet up this morning for this movement? How am I gonna keep them warm on this movement? How am I gonna keep from getting too hot? Same thing with your fingers, face, exposed skin. That's just, it's a brutal environment and it was really tough to, uh, to battle the cold there. Right at the end of the movement from 14,000 to 17,000 uh, foot, right before we got to like camp five, hear that or that last 100 meters uh, going up to the summit. Um, definitely the hardest part would have been uh, probably summit day. Just uh, my body did not perform like I wanted it to. The day I got back home from Denali, I went home, stepped on the scales, and realized I lost 15 pounds in two weeks. Is stuff crust, why would you have anything other than stuff crust if you had the option? <laughs> so I'm not superstitious, but, but I am a little stitious. <sighs> uh, yeah, I am down for some pizza. In gas station food in a gallon of water. <laughs> Let me sleep in the back of the van. All you can eat sushi. Oh yeah. That's that's where we need to go. All you can oh, eat sushi. Sushi would slap. Oh man, that's the spot. <laughs> you get your money back off like two or three, but yeah, I could probably eat a ton of sushi after yeah. after this. Burgers, Whole tacos, pizza, Italian food. Yeah. There's a Greek restaurant we can go get some like pita. Oh man, some gyros. We dude. Oh. The creperi. Oh man. Oh, that's right. You guys have a creperie. I haven't yeah. been. Oh, it's They've dope. got a creperie in, in Anchorage that I like going to, but I, I remember seeing y'all as I was like, man, we need to go there. Yeah, it, is, it is delicious. This is like bumping, too. Like, they got like yeah. outdoor seating. And well, they had a daily special that became so good that they put it on their menu, and it's like a like a Philly cheesesteak crepe, but it's not a cheese mm. crepe. It's like peppers, beef, cheese. A savory uh, crepe. Yes, yeah, so, super good.